We have some exciting events coming up at Tapestry. Today, following the service at 1130, there will be a presentation on home energy efficiency by the Center for Sustainable Energy. The presentation covers simple steps to reduce energy use, how to finance energy efficiency projects, and what rebates are available. Please plan to stay for this important event. Next Saturday is our service auction here at Tapestry. And there have been a lot of exciting things that have been offered for service auction items. I hope you will all come. It's a fun evening. And it's a chance to plan your social calendar for the next six months as you sign up for some of the dinners and events that, um, that have been offered. And we also, today, have blue buckets available for sale. You need to speak to someone at the um, Green Sanctuary Committee. The children have been decorating these buckets. They're useful for a lot of energy saving um, projects at home. And all the money that's raised goes to providing clean water in developing countries. So please see somebody from the Green Sanctuary Committee after the service. You can find information about these and other upcoming events in your order of service or on the website. Our various groups and events reflect our vision of being a transformational home for liberal spirituality and a dynamic community leader in Orange County and beyond. And now Linda Jurgen will light our flaming chalice, the central symbol of our Unitarian Universalist heritage. Our flame is a symbol of transcendence, truth triumphing over the forces of superstition and fear. Our circle proclaims that the earth and all its inhabitants are one, and from the common container of this chalice, we share the warm welcome of our beloved congregation. Please join me in saying our covenant, followed by our song of affirmation. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and service is its law. Today's opening words are written by Judy Brown, entitled, breathing space. What makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. Too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight, can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. So building fires requires attention to the spaces in between as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, then we can come to see how it is fuel and the absence of fuel together that make fire possible. We only need to lay a log lightly from time to time. A fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way. Today's pastoral joys and sorrows have some really good news. Nicola Stupka and her husband have welcomed their son, Hugo Elliott, so we now have a new member of the congregation. <laughs> Mother and son are doing well, and we hope to see everyone here at Tapestry soon. Penny and Dave Kinnear have asked us to hold their friend Kathy in our thoughts and prayers as she transitions from this life. Every day, sorrows and celebrations are experienced in the life of our community and beyond. Please join me in the congregational response. For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion. And now, our Director of Religious Education, Caitlin Riva, is back with us today and will now present our Time for All Ages. So I invite all the young and young at heart to come up front. And Looks like it is working. For those of you who don't know, I know all of you guys do, um, I was on maternity leave. So if you're new, uh, today's my first Sunday back. I start today. Um, we're having an auction next Saturday, so those of you who want to meet Opal, the, my new baby, she will be at the auction. So there's another incentive to come for an awesome night. She's not going to be an auction item. I'm going to keep her. I'm going to keep her for now. Because <laughs> so far it's going really well. <laughs> um, since today is my first day back, it was nice enough for the Green Sanctuary Committee to pick us a book to read today. All right, and it's called Let's Save Energy. You guys know what energy is? Yeah. What's energy? E equals 
Can you give it a different definition for the other ones? Albert Einstein. Okay, Albert Einstein's not the definition of energy, though. Energy is mass times. <laughs> We're going to go with energy makes things work or helps people move, okay? Gives power to things like our lights take energy or you guys eat food so you have energy, right? So you guys are strong. You're not wrong. That was just a, a hard definition, okay? So what is energy? Energy is power. Fuel, electricity, and heat are kinds of energy. So she's putting energy in her car, right? You guys fill up your cars? He's putting, he's putting dinosaur dust in the car. All right. Resources. Energy comes from Earth's resources. Water behind dams makes electricity. And many resources are finite, which means that there aren't they don't last forever, so we want to conserve energy, which means we don't want to use it all the time. People use a lot of energy. Scientists think we could run out someday. Earth could run out of resources like oil, right? Which is why, what other energies do we have? Wind, and then ten solar. Years later, our ancestors are using our guts. Okay. <laughs> well, they do biofuel. <laughs> all right, so it says help save energy. Jenny saves energy in her home. She turns off the lights when she leaves her room. Do you guys do that? Turn off your lights. Sam grabs juice from the fridge. He closes the door right away to keep the air cool inside. Because if you leave the fridge door open, the fridge has to work harder to make it cool. My fridge beeps at me if I forget to close it in time. Jenny's video game uses electricity. Jenny turns off her game when she's done. Right? Just turn off your TV if you're not watching it. Billy turns down the temperature, then the furnace uses less fuel. Billy wears a sweater to stay warm. That's not much of an issue here, but people who live where it's really cold, um, I guess in the summer it's an issue here because people want to put their air conditions at 80 rather than what would feel nice at, what, 72 or, <laughs> or 70? Sarah and her mom save fuel. They bike to the store instead of driving. Do you guys walk anywhere instead of take the car? I walk to school. You walk to school. There you go. That saves energy. Remember to save energy every day. You can save resources by using less energy. My daughter's school has a walk to school Wednesday, so everybody's supposed to walk to school on Wednesdays. Oh, and that is the end. Well, a mile's not that far to walk. You can walk a mile, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well then don't walk to school. You can take the bus, and that saves energy because more people will use it. Well, there you go. If he can walk nine miles, you can walk a mile, Jack, to school. <laughs> All right, that is the end of our story. <laughs> we are going to go to class and further this discussion. Our reading today is number 550 in your gray hymnal, We Belong to the Earth. I will read the part in regular type and invite you to read the part in italic type. This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. This we know. All things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. We did not weave the web of life. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Today our special music is Set Fire to the Rain by Adele. It will be performed by our music director, Melissa Sky Eagle. Good morning and thanks so much for having me. My name again is Mike Levin and I've really appreciated the chance to get to know David and Julia and to learn more about tapestry. And I can definitely relate to affirming a diversity of religious belief. After all, my dad is Jewish, my mom is Catholic, my wife was raised Presbyterian. Our son attends an Episcopal school, which means I better be open-minded or I'm going to be in big trouble. It was also great to learn about your seven Unitarian Universalist principles. I was particularly intrigued by the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent, interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Because when you think about it, the whole issue of climate change and environmental pollution comes down to respect. It's respect for the coastal communities 
whose very existence could be threatened by our habits. It's respect for those living in the inner cities who breathe toxic air pollutants that cause asthma and premature death. And it's respect for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations that we won't meet, but whose lives we certainly will impact. Before going any further, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Los Angeles and moved to South Orange County when I was eight years old. And after college and law school, and a few twists and turns in democratic politics, I found myself working at a law firm representing a number of different clients. And there was one client in particular that I loved working for. They were a clean energy startup company. And when I did work for them, I finally felt like I was using all this education and experience for something greater than my own self-interest. So I went to work full time for that company. And I've been in the clean energy sector ever since. And I can think of nothing better to do with myself than to try to make a positive impact on our energy and environmental future. Another thing I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about is how to communicate about climate change. And I feel like South Orange County is a perfect training ground. Look, if we can convince our conservative friends and neighbors of the urgency to act, maybe we'll be able to slow this whole thing down once and for all. It turns out there's a great group in the UK called Climate Outreach. It consists of scientists, government officials, and communications experts. They've developed a framework to talk to conservatives about energy and the environment. And they've done a lot of research and focus groups. In fact, just like tapestry, they have seven key principles. So let me share them with you. And keep in mind, when I talk about these principles, I'm going to use my own examples while working in some of the language and the framing that they've developed. First principle, when we're talking about energy and the environment, we should try to speak from a values up rather than a numbers down perspective. And let me explain what I mean. Climate change is a scientific fact. There's broad consensus that it's caused by human activity. And it's increasingly a lived human experience. But it's not yet something we necessarily see and feel every day. We don't live near glaciers and polar bears. And it's easy to write things off like our drought as a random act of nature. So while understanding the statistics about how we're changing our planet is really important, the statistics themselves are not the best persuasive tools to try to get others to agree. So what are the tools that we should be using? Well, that gets to the second principle. The British study says that one of the most powerful frames is the term avoiding waste. We know that one of the best ways to reduce our carbon footprint is simply to use less energy. And when you think about it, avoiding waste is the original conservative principle. No one likes to see things go to waste. That's just common sense. My wife and I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old. They're in that room over there. They've been very quiet throughout this whole thing. Hopefully everything's OK. And we try to show them that it's irresponsible to be wasteful. We don't like to throw away food. We don't like to keep the lights on in rooms when we're not using them, although my wife can attest that sometimes I do that. But directly related to avoiding waste is also avoiding money. And if there's something, or, uh, avoiding wasted money. And if there's something that conservatives don't like wasting, particularly, it's money. So many of the renewable solutions out there actually are saving people money. There's going to be a great workshop at 1130 that I hope a lot of people can stay for from a group called the, the Center for Sustainable Energy. I'm actually on the board of that group. And they go around community after community. And they talk about saving money by using renewable energy. And in fact, I'd argue that the only way you're going to convince conservatives of the efficacy of all this is that you've got to save money. It's got to be something that saves money. So the third principle is use trusted communicators. And what do I mean by that? It's not good enough if we're just preaching to ourselves. There are actually some great conservatives out there talking about energy and environmental issues in a positive way. And it's on us to highlight their work. And one person that I love to bring up is Bob Inglis. Now, if you never heard of Bob Inglis, he served in Congress for over a decade as a Republican in South Carolina. 
And according to a profile in Slate, once his children reached voting age, they persuaded him to take a closer look at climate science. So he traveled to Antarctica twice. And in his conversations with scientists, he was convinced that climate change was indeed a growing threat that everyone needed to take seriously, especially conservatives. Science plus his deep faith convinced him that taking action on climate and saving countless lives in the process was the right thing to do. He's no longer in Congress, but he continues his work through a nonprofit called the Energy and Enterprise Initiative based in Washington, DC. So here's a little known fact. For years now, the Republican electorate has been shifting towards accepting the scientific consensus on climate change, particularly among younger Republicans. A recent Yale survey showed moderate Republicans who still make up about half of all Republican voters are now essentially indistinguishable from the general population in terms of their belief on climate. More than 70%, 70% of Republicans now believe that human activities are contributing to climate change. So perhaps all we need is a climate action proposal that conservatives can get excited about. And that's where Bob Inglis comes in. Essentially what he's proposed is cover for his Republican colleagues to vote for a price on carbon, also called a carbon tax, by offsetting any revenue it produces with equal cuts in corporate taxes and personal income taxes. As the Slate piece said, it could be tricky to pull off, but if done the right way, it would probably be popular with almost everyone and an efficient way of tackling climate change. So the fourth principle, rebuild trust in renewables. And I think we can do this by emphasizing three things. First, their economic benefits. Second, their national security benefits. And third, the diversity of renewable resources. First, the economic benefits. Solar and wind have been under a lot of scrutiny. This last election cycle, you heard about Solyndra, and look, that's a real story, you know, that, that really happened. And particularly some of the larger scale projects you read about not being the greatest. The bottom line is that we need to be honest and straightforward that most landowners support these projects because they're good business opportunities, rather than for any other reason. We also need to wean our industry off subsidies. And I say that, of, you know, I've fought for subsidies for the last 15 years for a variety of clients. We need to wean our industry off subsidies. So there's this great book called Breakthrough. And in that book, two environmentalists, Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schellenberger, advocate a move away from this whole pollution paradigm where we talk about climate change insofar as, as pollution. And, you know, it's a familiar storyline of environmental consequences if greenhouse gas emissions are not radically reduced. We've all heard that before. They offer an alternative communication strategy, which involves turning to what they call the economic development frame. Recasting climate change is an opportunity to grow the economy. The two authors argue that only by refocusing messages and building diverse coalitions in support of innovative energy technology and sustainable economic prosperity can we meaningfully take action on the climate. And with this framing strategy, they seek to engage support for energy policies among conservatives who think predominantly in terms of market opportunities, as well as labor advocates who value the possibility of job growth. Second, the national security benefits. So later you're going to have a workshop from the Center for Sustainable Energy. The man that runs that group is a dear friend. Uh, he's a retired uh, rear admiral in the Navy, Len Herring. And Len recently wrote a piece for the Sacramento Bee uh, called Boosting Renewable Energy Will Improve Our National Security. And I love when Len, who has tremendous cred credibility as a former rear admiral of the Navy, talks about this. And here's what Len wrote. Energy is key to accomplishing our mission. And the US Department of Defense is the world's largest consumer of fuel. And while we're not going to run out of oil tomorrow, our heavy reliance on a single source poses a strategic threat, especially as the ever-changing security landscape requires our troops to travel long distances at a moment's notice. To address those security concerns, the military is adapting. Remote outposts in Afghanistan are powering communications equipment with solar technology. 
Moreover, the Pentagon is committed to powering installations with 30% renewables by 2025. Losing air conditioning during a hot summer is inconvenient in your home, but it can be downright deadly when a military base loses power and is no longer available to support critical operations. For our energy security, that means we must diversify with clean, reliable sources. Pretty powerful message. Third, I think we need to talk about the diversity of renewable resources, not just solar, not just wind, but particularly things like bioenergy. Now, I heard one of the, the children talking about dinosaur guts. I don't necessarily mean dinosaur guts. But when I drive up and down the California coast, you know, you, you smell and see cows, right, up in Coalinga and off 5 and off 99. And when I see those cows, I see a future opportunity to power our homes and to fuel our vehicles. And that's because my employer actually manufactures power plants that can produce electricity, heat, and hydrogen fuel that can then be used for hydrogen electric cars. And we helped bring one of the first hydrogen fueling stations in the country to Fountain Valley, to Orange County, and it uses the biogas from the wastewater plant. So this is technology that's available today. So it's not just solar and wind, but there's all sorts of innovative technologies. Uh, and I expect that uh, when you look at all of the methane in California, all of the cows up and down the state, you know, right now a lot of that methane is just going up into the atmosphere. But I don't think in 10 or 20 years it will be. I think we're going to be capturing it, cleaning it, and using it for electricity and for fuel for cars. Who knew cow manure could be so exciting, right? <laughs> so principle five, and I'll go quickly through these last three. Focus on the community level when it comes to uh, renewable energy. So things like solar sited on roofs as opposed to out in the desert, unused spaces in local neighborhoods, brown fields, things like that. The data suggests that conservatives are a lot less skeptical of local projects as opposed to large-scale renewables that are perceived to require a lot more government support. The sixth principle is to be moderate and balanced in describing the effectiveness of renewable technologies. So big claims about the transformational potential of large scale sometimes are distrusted and may backfire. We need to be honest about the successes and the failures in our industry. The reality is we're going to have plenty more of both, but that's what it takes to make progress in any industry. Energy is no different. And finally, number seven, when talking about energy and environmental issues, particularly with conservatives, we should focus on young people. According to climate outreach, climate risks are considered much more real uh, to conservatives who are under 30. So communications about climate change that focus on this younger generation are quite smart because they inherently get the problem and they want it fixed. And the question we have to ask is what are the best mechanisms to get it fixed? And market-driven approaches, things like cap and trade. You know, we have cap and trade in California. That was a Republican idea. We forget about this. The air resource, hopefully that's not mine. The, the California Air Resources Board is often criticized as being very progressive, very liberal. But that, you know, cap and trade at its core was, was a Republican principle that was devised by the first Bush administration to deal with acid rain. It was very effective in doing that. The same with the carbon tax. These are very free market principles if people will just stop and think and hopefully they will. So let me add a few thoughts in closing. Living in South Orange County like you, I have plenty of conservative friends and neighbors and I've asked a lot of them for their opinions on energy and the environment. What I've found is air quality is not a partisan issue. Most of my Republican friends are pro-business but not at the expense of our quality of life, particularly for our children. So when we can combine ideas that are pro-business, pro-quality of life, pro-environment, and not perceived as heavy-handed government takeover, we create a scenario that is hard to oppose, and we can begin to build some respect again. I hope you'll help me and spread the word. Thank you. <laughs>